Yeah. Um, so today, uh, you'll see me get up a number of times to introduce introducers. And um, the, the next introducer is uh, Professor of Computer Science, Soren Israel, who will uh, be introducing a very special guest uh, today, Marina von Neumann Whitman. Uh, I would like to point to you uh, our beautiful poster to encourage you to take one home. Uh, <laughs> Posting your department. And uh, as we are celebrating from my mind here, there is a quote here Journey was here. Uh, indeed, uh, through the miracle of publishing the letters that were written at that time, I'm not sure how today with email we will do this, but we learned that actually John von Neumann was at Brown lecturing in 1934. So he wrote in a letter to his friend physicist, uh, Rudolf Ortway, we are well, although I am a bit pumped dry, for I held three lectures last week at Yale, Harvard, and Brown University. <laughs> So uh, this was in 1934. A year later, uh, and the daughter, uh, Marina von Neumann, Whitman is with us today to say a few words about her father. So uh, Professor uh, von Neumann Whitman is a distinguished economist, professor of business administration and public policy at the University of Michigan. From 79 to 92, she was uh, vice president and chief economist of GE. No, GM. Sorry. GM. GM. <laughs> General Motors Corporation. Sorry. Uh, uh, she also served in various other government uh, positions, including being uh, uh, member of the President Nixon's uh, Council of Economic Advisors and then Director of the Council of Foreign Relations. Uh, her career uh, spanned not only academia and government and corporate, uh, but also distinguished career in publishing and so on and so on. Uh, uh, a lot of awards, too many to mention. Uh, in particular, she was uh, on the Board of Trustees of Institute for Advanced Study of Princeton University and Board of Overseas of Harvard University. As far as corporate directorship, Procter & Gamble, J.P. Morgan Chase, Chase Manhattan. Uh, she uh, received uh, her undergraduate from Harvard, or roughly now Harvard, top of her class, continuing uh, her uh, MA and a PhD from Columbia University. She is the author of many books, recipient of numerous fellowship awards, and holds over 20 college honorary degrees from universities. So without further ado, Professor Whitman, welcome. Thank you, sir, and I should comment that this is my second appearance at such a colloquium, the first one having been five years ago. Um, I'm the one who showed up a day late or uh, due to an administrative error, which means that although I would have understood some of the economics talks, I will understand absolutely none of the physics while I'm <laughs> looking forward. And of course, you know about the University of Michigan. Uh, we took your provost, uh, Mark Schussel, and made him our president. And I must say, he was off to a wonderful start. Um, not every president has to deal with a football scandal in his first two weeks on the job. So, um, Soren and I talked about uh, what I might say, and we agreed that I would read you the prologue, which is four or five pages, of my memoir, a book entitled The Martian's Daughter, and some of you at least will know why that is the title. Um, and. Uh, because I think it does give you uh, 
although it's my memoir, uh, quite a picture of my father in his last, well, in, in his life, but also in his last days. <coughs> in September of 1956, I was sitting in the ante room of an elegant hospital suite at Walter Reed Hospital in Bethesda in a VIP wing reserved for the president and other high-ranking individuals, both civilian and military. <clears throat> Nothing could calm my apprehension as I waited to be called into the hospital room where my father, the mathematician Jonathan Norman, lay dying of cancer that had by then spread throughout his body and into his brain. My father had been given this suite partly out of respect for the central role he had played, first as a key member of the Los Alamos Brain Trust, uh, and later as a member of the Atomic Energy Commission and a senior advisor to several high-ranking military panels and committees, all deeply engaged in maintaining U.S. nuclear, nuclear superiority. The more important consideration, though, was national security. Given the top-secret nature of my father's involvements, absolute privacy was essential when, in the early stages of his hospitalization, various top-ranking members of the military-industrial establishment sat at his bedside to pick his brain before it was too late. He was assigned as his full-time, uh, he was assigned eight airmen, all with top secret clearance, rotated around the clock. Their job was both to attend to his everyday needs and in the later stages of his illness, to assure that affected by medication or the advancing cancer, he did not inadvertently blurt out military secrets. I hadn't seen my father since the spring vacation of my senior year in college. My final exams and June graduation had been followed only a week later by my wedding at my mother's home in Long Island, which he had been too ill to attend. <clears throat> now I was returning to a particularly grim reality. I had been spending the past few months in an emotional high of academic triumph and newlywed bliss. While back in Washington, my father and stepmother had been struggling every day with the disease that was destroying not only his body, but even more unbearably, his amazing mind. To compound my guilt, I knew only too well that my father had been deeply upset and disappointed by my insistence on getting married so young. I was just 21. He feared that such an early commitment would thwart my own opportunities for intellectual and professional development miring me in the full-time domesticity that was expected of married women in the 1950s. In letter after letter, he often expressed in writing feelings he could not bring himself to talk about. My father had begged me, and these are quotes, don't tie yourself down at such an early age, and thus throw away any chance of fulfilling your own talents. My father had already been hospitalized and unable to walk when I'd last visited him, but his mind had still been in high gear. So I couldn't entirely conceal my shock when I entered the room and leaned down to kiss him. Tension and awkwardness choked my voice as I murmured, hello, daddy. He looked small and shrunken in bed. And though he still spoke in the clipped, analytical manner that had always defined him, his sentences were short and focused exclusively on his own condition. Terror of his own mortality had crowded out all other thoughts. After only a few minutes, my father made what seemed to me a very peculiar and frightening request. He wanted me to give him two numbers, like seven and six or ten and three, and ask, me, and ask him to tell me their sum. For as long as I could remember, I had always known that my father's major source of self-regard, what he felt to be the very essence of his being, was his incredible mental capacity. In this late stage of his illness, he must have been aware that this capacity was rapidly deteriorating, and the panic that caused was worse than any physical pain. In demanding that I test him on these elementary sums, he was seeking reassurance that at least a tiny fragment of his intellectual powers remained. I could only choke out a couple of these pairs of numbers, and then, without even registering his answers, fled the room in tears. <coughs> <clears throat> uh, months earlier, we talked with a candor rare for the time about the fact that at a shockingly young age and in the midst of an extraordinarily productive life, he was going to die. 
But that was still a father to daughter discussion with him in the dominant role. This sudden humiliating role reversal, reversal compounded both his pain and mine. After that, my father spoke very little or not at all, although the doctors couldn't offer any physical reason for his retreat into silence. My own explanation was the sheer horror of experiencing the deterioration of his mental powers at the age of 53 was too much for him to bear. Added to this pain, I fear, was my apparent a betrayal of his dreams for his only child, his link to the future which was being denied to him. My father had been shaped by and then played a central role in the defining events of the first half of the 20th century. His youth was punctuated by global upheavals. Hungary had been on the defeated side in World War I and had been punished by the loss of two-thirds of its territory in the Treaty of, Treaty of Ter Trianon in 1920. His family had fled in fear of their lives from a revolutionary communist government that seized power in Hungary and held it for 130 three days in 1919. And he had made a prescient shift across the Atlantic as a precocious young professor of mathematics to Princeton from the University of Berlin, just as the collapse of the impoverished and embittered German nation's democratic government paved the way for Hitler's rise. Once settled in the United States, he became a key player in the Manhattan Project, which produced the atomic bomb and put an end to World War II as well as the development of a hydrogen bomb, whose shadow dominated the Cold War. His invention of game theory enabled innovative approaches to military strategy and gave birth to entirely new ways of analyzing and making predictions about such disparate phenomena as business competition, diplomatic negotiations, gambling strategies, and the evolution of cancer cells and his description of the logical architecture that underpins the modern electronic computer provided an essential base for the development of successively smaller, cheaper, and more powerful machines, up to and including the infinite variety of smart electronics that, together with the internet, have revolutionized every aspect of modern life and human interaction. John von Neumann is often referred to as one of the Martians, five Hungarian Jewish physicists born in turn-of-the-century Budapest, all of whom spent most of their scientific lives in the United States and made fundamental contributions to the Allied victory in World War II. Four of them, Leo Szilard, Eugene Wigner, von Neumann, and Edward Teller, were at the forefront of developing the atomic bomb. The fifth and oldest, Theodor von Karman, was a pioneer in supersonic flight. The story goes that some of the participants in the Manhattan Project, speculating on how there came to be so many, so many brilliant Hungarians in their midst, <coughs> concluded that these colleagues were really creatures from Mars who disguised their non-human origins by speaking Hungarian. <laughs> As this remarkable man in my life was ending, I was just becoming an adult starting out on a life path that would involve me closely in some of the defining events in the second half of the 20th century. I was a pioneer in an early beneficiary of the feminist wave that swept the nation in the 60s and 70s, opening up new opportunities for women, women who dared to think that they could have it all. I ventured into economics, a field dominated by men, and climbed the academic ladder by focusing my teaching and research on the economic interdependence among nations long before globalization had become part of our everyday vocabulary. And as Soren has already mentioned, I was the first woman on the President's Council of Economic Advisors. Uh, I was elected as the first female member of the Board of Directors of some major co companies. I was a senior executive at GM. Uh, struggling to awaken its top management to the threats that confronted it. Uh, <clears throat> to some extent, and by the way, I failed. <laughs> I was their Cassandra, and all the terrible things I said would happen if they didn't change did in fact come true. To some extent, my involvement in all of these events 
was possible because I was in the right place at the right time. But my parents, and particularly my father, also played a crucial part. The example he set by his life, the environment in which he embedded my adolescence, his expectations of me and my responses to those expectations were all critical in shaping my own life. Were it not for his oft-repeated conviction that everyone, man or woman, had a moral obligation to make full use of his or her intellectual capacities, I might not have pushed myself to such a level of academic achievement or set my sights on a lifelong professional commitment at a time when society made it difficult for a woman to combine a career with family obligations. If I had not grown up in the cosmopolitan atmosphere of a family dinner table around which gathered some of the greatest minds of the 20th century, I might have been less attuned to the economic and political relationships among nations that became the focus of my academic career. And without my the example of my father's immersion in the affairs of government, I might not have felt the pull of Washington strongly enough to uproot my family and move there for three different government assignments in three years. Yet perhaps the most powerful motivator of all was my determination to escape from the shadow of this larger and than life parent. My desire to prove him wrong in his fear that my early marriage would thwart his hopes and ambitions for my own future. I was determined to prove that his expectations for my intellectual and professional success, and my own for marriage and children with a man I had fallen in love with while still a teenager, need not be mutually exclusive. With every new achievement in my life, with every barrier broken, came an overwhelming urge to say to my father, you see, I defied you by doing what I wanted, but I'm also doing what you wanted me to do. After all, 